Hello, everyone. I'm David Mintz. I'm the Director of Psychiatric Education, a team leader at the Austin Riggs Center, which is a tertiary care center for the treatment of patients with treatment-resistant psychiatric conditions. It's also a psychoanalytic hospital or psychodynamic hospital, so uh, the dynamics of patients are considered to be an important aspect of care. I'm also the former leader of the Psychotherapy Caucus of the American Psychiatric Association, and so psychotherapy is an important part of the ways that I think about doing pharmacotherapy. Okay, so at this point, I think we're going to switch gears just a little bit, and I think we've been talking more clinical what you do when you're sitting with a patient, and we're just going to step back to the level of the evidence base behind a lot of what I've been talking about over the last videos. And so we're going to start focusing on the science of the art of psychopharmacotherapy. And it is probably important to say, and it's been implied in everything I've said so far, that medication outcomes we know are influenced by a range of psychosocial factors. And this includes prescriber effects, characteristics of the pill, setting of administration, which is why the gold standard of medication trials would be a multi-center placebo-controlled trial, because I think we learned already in the 1950s and 60s that you could get fantastic results at one research site and non-significant results at another based on the patient population, the setting, the people. I would say non-clinical patient characteristics also influence how medications work, and by on clinical patient characteristics, I mean not necessarily characteristics of the illness, but things about the patient, their psychology, their coping, their psychosocial factors in which they're embedded, all of that, and of course, the therapeutic alliance. So for starters, I just want to highlight a study that I think casts this in a very clear light, which is a secondary analysis of the TDCRP, the treatment of depression, collaborative research project was, before STAR-D, the largest NIMH-funded multi-center placebo-controlled trial that had been done looking at treatments for depression. And in that study, they were comparing psychodynamic treatments or IPT, cognitive behavioral treatments, and then pharmacotherapy. The basic results of that study were they were all about equally effective and the combinations of medications and psychotherapy was perhaps a little bit more effective. But McKay, ML, and Wampold in 2006 went back and did a secondary analysis of that data looking through the lens of the prescriber. And what they found interestingly was that physician effects accounted for greater variability in outcomes than did the medication condition itself. So it turned out, for example, that if a physician got a good result with one patient, they tended to get good results with all the patients. And if a physician got poor results with a patient, they tended to get poor results with all the patients. And so using the statistical technique of linear hierarchical modeling, they were able to stratify the prescribers in this study into those who were highly effective or got good results, those who were modestly effective, and those who tended to be relatively ineffective in their prescribing. And, of course, in terms of the study results, the effects were additive. So the psychiatrists who rated as the higher-functioning psychiatrists, when they used the active medication, tended to get the best results. The patients who recovered least in the study were those who got a placebo and had the psychiatrists who were relatively ineffective. I think the really striking finding in this study was that the top one-third of psychiatrists got better outcomes with placebo than the bottom third got with active drug. Just think for a second about what this means. Top third of psychiatrists did better giving placebo than the bottom third did prescribing an active antidepressant. And, you know, we do not actually know what those top one-third psychiatrists were doing, because process research is difficult, and I think nobody's getting rich by doing that. But there is a suggestion based on another arm of that study that suggests that the clinicians 
who had a psychological theory of depression seemed to get better results than those who had a purely biomedical theory of depression. Now, that was looking at all of the people in the study, but the therapists, uh, the people who were doing psychotherapy, and the people who were doing medication, so it wasn't broken down. So we don't know for sure that that is the thing that differentiated the doctors. But it does highlight, I think, what Michael Balint, a uh, psychoanalyst, who gave us the concept of patient-centeredness and also, I think, the concept of uh, the psychodynamic formulation, when he said uh, in 1958, the doctor is the drug. And I think we need to keep in mind that our presence with the patient, the way we sit with the patient, makes a huge difference. The characteristics of the pill also affect outcome. So the color of the pill makes a difference. And we know, in terms of placebo research, red pills tend to be energizing, and blue pills tend to be calming in most cases, but not all cases. We know shapes of the pills, the route of administration, all affect how well our pills work. And expensive pills appear also to work better. So a patient is, in the course of the study, is led to believe the pill they are taking is, uh, you know, 25 cents or like $85, if the patient thinks they're getting the more expensive pill, they tend to have a bigger response. In terms, again, of the power of the psychological dimension of all of this, placebo effects are a major factor in psychiatric treatment outcomes, and particularly with antidepressants. The evidence suggests that more than three-quarters of medication effects can be attributed to placebo. And a lot of published meta-analyses, uh, maybe closer to 50%, but those studies, of course, have the problem of publication bias. So you know, if a study finds that the drug is effective, it's more likely to get published. And if it finds there's no difference from placebo, that study is much more likely to languish on the uh, researcher's desk and eventually fall into the garbage can and disappear. But a number of researchers have looked at a relatively unbiased sample, which is the FDA drug study database. And when you are proposing a new medication, you tell the FDA, I am going to do these studies. And the FDA gets all those studies, whether they have a positive finding or a negative finding. So that's a relatively unbiased sample. And a number of researchers, Kirsch and Saperstein, Con Warner and Brown, and Kirsch Moore and Scoboria, all looked at this particular database. And when looking at that database for antidepressants, what they found was somewhere between 75 and 81% of drug response with antidepressants is attributable to the placebo effect. And it is really important to hold in mind that placebo does not mean imaginary. I mean, these are real effects. I mean, we know if you, if you can lower blood pressure with placebos. You can give somebody a placebo analgesic and put a myograph needle in a nerve and measure a decrease in pain transmission. So the mental factor is extremely powerful and real and persistent. And actually probably is getting bigger as people place more and more stock in pharmacotherapy. Another factor in terms of who the patient is that influences how medications are going to work is uh, character and temperament. So we know that our patients with higher levels of neuroticism are less likely to have a good antidepressant response. Similarly, patients with an immature defensive style are also less likely to have a good antidepressant response. And these are patients who, for whom, you know, combination at least with psychotherapy is probably indicated. Patients who have an internal locus of control actually do better with antidepressants than patients who have an external locus of control. And the dimensions of autonomy and sociotropy also influence medication outcomes. So I think we understand what autonomy is. People who feel like they're self-motivated, in charge of themselves, you know, are willing to go their own way. Sociotropy is a personality characteristic where people are highly attuned to their social environment, anxiously attuned. They want to please, they have a hard time disagreeing, and are really quite concerned with their standing with other people. So patients who are high in autonomy and low in sociotropy have about a three-quarters of them will have a good antidepressant response, whereas patients who are high in sociotropy and low in autonomy, only about a third of those patients will have a good antidepressant response. Our patients' attitudes also affect 
how well medications are going to work. So we know the patients who have very high expectations of treatment also have very high response rates, as much as 90% to antidepressants, whereas those patients who have a low expectation, only about a third of those are going to respond to antidepressants. And also in terms of expectations, we know that negative expectations of treatment make it more likely that patients are going to have experienced side effects, which really are, in many cases, nocebo responses related to the expectation of being harmed. In terms of patient attitudes, also, lastly, it is worth noting that the patient's theory of illness influences how their medications are going to work. So it turns out, actually, that patients who have a psychological theory of depression, uh, who view their depression as non-biologic, tend actually to have better outcomes with antidepressants, at least with mild to moderate depression. It seems like once you get into severe depression, this differentiation does not hold. But for patients with mild to moderate depression, they are more likely to benefit if they see their depression as psychologic. So just to reiterate some key points, first of all, I think while psychiatry has become increasingly focused on the provision of evidence-based treatment, in practice, this is often meant to focus on the biomedical evidence base, which connects a medication response with particular diagnostic categories. At the same time, there's been a general neglect of this psychosocial evidence base that I'm describing that provides guidance to the prescriber on how to prescribe rather than on what to prescribe in order to achieve optimum outcomes. In many cases, actually, psychosocial factors exert a larger effect on medication outcome than does the actual medication. And as we said, the person of the prescriber, as well as the patient's history, temperament, attitudes, and beliefs, all profoundly shape treatment outcomes and should be considered by us when we are trying to address our patients and particularly our treatment refractory patients.